Uh, I'm Thomas Anderson. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but you can certainly see what my credentials are. Um, but I'll speak to on, on sort of behalf of both of us. Uh, we're both former carrier pricing managers uh, with with the company called LJM Group. Uh, we do small parcel analytics, um, auditing, uh, cost optimization, contract contract op optimization. Um, and Kenneth and I are both partners in the company. Uh, our owner is over here. Uh, and then we have uh, three others with the organization that's in the back. We are at booth uh, 813, in case you're able to uh, come see us later on today. And I skipped over Kenneth's uh, bio because when we turn it over to him halfway through, then uh, he'll go through sort of a little bit more about his, uh, his background. So our agenda today is really to look at um, 2024 uh, GRI. So the state increase is 5.9%, which uh, will really vary based on a shipment profile. Uh, we also want to address sort of the historical aspect of the GRI and how that comes into play, as well as um, really some of the things to expect in the future in terms of the GRI as well. So this is really the historical rate increase. So um, prior to uh, the last three years, 4.9% was sort of the, the known number uh, year after year. So uh, one exception was uh, the 2017 year, where it was 3.9 on the FedEx side. And really, when you think of these numbers in terms of what that means in, in terms of the rest of the world, I mean, 5.9% increase is pretty pretty significant. Um, yes, it's a drop down from the 6.9% that was announced last year, uh, but in line with the year prior. So, um, but I think what you'll see today is really depending on your profile, this 5.9% will really not mean 5.9%. So this was what was announced uh, FedEx about two weeks ago, uh, basically came out with this statement. Um, UPS followed about a week, about a week ago. Um, the difference so far is that FedEx has actually listed uh, their uh, list rates. They, they published their list rates. So we know exactly what they are doing in terms of uh, transportation charges and accessorials. Uh, UPS has not yet published theirs. So, um, you know, we don't have UPS details, obviously, because they're not available at this point, but we can draw on assumptions on the FedEx compared to UPS historically, uh, I think, to be able to, so you can have a pretty good sense of what to expect if you're more of a UPS shop than, than FedEx. So, just to be clear, the 5.9% increase, when they communicate this, they make it specific to transportation charges only. So accessorial is a whole different category, could be significantly higher, it usually is. Um, so some, to most people, they're, they're aware of that, some people are not. So what does 5.9% mean? It's really all about the you know, devils in the details, if you will. So before we really get into, I would say the meat of it, um, one thing to point out is when we look at our client base, a little bit more than 2,000 shippers, um, this is really their breakdown based on domestic service usage. So 45% of the volume is ground commercial, 25% or so is in the ground residential, close to 10% Sherpas are ground economy, and then goes on and on. You can see very little usage in two-day air AM, first overnight, as you expect. Uh, even three-day is, is being used less and less just because multiple DCs and so forth. I um, feel like this is important to keep in mind as we go through things, because again, when they say 5.9% across all services, there's a uh, definitely a different level of, of increase that does apply. We also look at weight distribution on the right-hand side, and that's where you'll see um, you know, majority of the volume, almost half to spend, is in the, the category of 1 to 10 pounds. 35% of the total spend is in the 1 to 5 pound range. That means probably half the volume, if not more, is in the one to five pound range, which makes those those weights obviously more meaningful, more impactful than some of the other areas. And then in terms of looking back at last year, so we, we're probably a week or two out from being able to run the GRI analysis on all our clients for 24 for, on the FedEx side. Um, and obviously we're nowhere close on the UPS until they come out with their, their rates. But looking at 23's increase. So where we were at 6.9%, I'll try to use this. You know, so 7% is right along with that 6.9. Out of this this sample of 24 clients, fairly random, 80% um, surpassed the actual 6.9% range. So um, 
even what it's announced at 6.9 last year, 80% of certainly this this client base would have surpassed that amount. So um, again, it's it's likely that you're probably in this particular bucket. Uh, it does vary though, if you have a rate cap, uh, then you look at this much smaller sample, uh, but you can see there that really the high was about 5%. So where the average in the non-GRI uh, rate cap uh, was probably in the seven and a half percent range. Here we're really like four and a half percent, and that could be a three, three and a half, four, four and a half percent rate cap. But those things really protect you. Um, I'm not permitted to speak about that further. But afternoon session, I'm sure they'll talk about the importance of having a rate cap. And I know we get into a lot of numbers here. Uh, part of this is that there will be a deck that you will be able to view. So obviously, you'll be able to get into some of these details. But this sort of ties into uh, our focus on, obviously, we have to focus on FedEx because that's the information we have. But when you start looking at the services between UPS and FedEx, next to here, this is really the variance. So wherever there's a positive number, um, UPS has a higher rate structure. Wherever there's a negative number, FedEx is the higher of the two. Uh, so looking at next to air, you can see basically 1% variance between FedEx and UPS with UPS being 1% higher on average. The same goes on next year's Sabre, two days about, you know, less than less than half percent on average. The one area that stands out is obviously three day where FedEx is substantially higher, uh, but ground is almost identical. So again, coming back to, um, you know, what we anticipate with FedEx, we can expect UPS to pretty much follow to keep aligned with this structure. We showed also based on a zone distribution, uh, it really doesn't show a whole lot of different uh, output. So uh, we'll just continue at this point. So let's start with the minimum charges. This is obviously one of those areas that are truly impactful for many. Um, this year's increase, you can see, and, and I'll explain this graph, and then I think other ones will make more sense. Um, so we're really starting with the, the furthest out, 2017, going year by year up to the most recent here on the far right. So each column, the far right numbers will be your increase this year on the minimum charges. Um, and this will be a similar graph that you'll see for other services. So basically year after year, um, and then you'll see a breakdown uh, just structured this way. So this year, 1070, I think is the most meaningful. Most contracts have a reduction in terms of monetary reduction in their contracts. So if you have a dollar reduction, now you can expect to be 970 versus last year, it would have been uh, $9.10. Uh, if there's a percentage reduction, then you're a little bit more favorable in terms of getting that minimum reduced. But um, at least that's, you know, uh, I think that's the most meaningful number here anyway. So now getting into more of the trends. So I, you know, I know there's a lot of numbers here, really not a better way, I think, to, to show it though. Um, and the trends are pretty, pretty meaningful, you know, especially when you start looking back at like last year where you had these substantial jumps to the further zones this year, you know, considering that the profile, um, the majority of the volume being in the lighter, lighter weights, it's actually not as punishing as maybe you would expect in, in some prior years. Um, so this year, 5.7% increase to zone two and sorry. So really, yes, yeah, so zone distributions of, so. I think I got into the weight distribution. I, I apologize if I did, but in terms of zone distribution near zones, we're going to be at 5.7, 5.8. And then we go into sort of leveling off at 6.6 .6 to the far zones. Uh, when you look at this based on a weight distribution, which is where I started talking about 5.5% um, increase in the lighter weights, which is a little bit unpredicted. You know, we, we would think it would surpass 6% because they sort of can get away with that. Um, and then we do see a leveling off to 6.4, 6.3 in the heavier weights. So, you know, really to a certain extent, the ground, which we really expect to also apply to the ground economy, uh, as well as the home delivery, those are all probably a little less punishing than we would anticipate. So if your profile is in that e-commerce, uh, lightweight ground, home delivery, um, ground economy, then you can predict that it might be in that 5.5 to uh, 5.6% increase versus the 5.9 that's stated. Domestic air services, we start on a high level. So priority overnight, 
um, is the 6% increase stated. We get to standard overnight 6.1%, two-day air 6.8, and express saver is 6.4, so the three-day 6.4. This you'll see is will show very different results as we go through the numbers, however, based on someone's likely profile. So in terms of a breakdown of uh, priority, um, in terms of the zone distribution, really nothing you know, of, of great significance there in terms of variance. We see a low of, I think it's 5.4% and a high of 6.4%. So you know, align with that 5.9, again, if the profile is to further zones, which a lot of priority would be, it's expected that it'd probably be in the 6.2 to 6.4% range, um, but not anything of any, any you know, drastic uh, uh, you know, significance. When you look at this based on a weight distribution, pretty much 6.8% across the board, uh, the exception being to the heavyweight, 70 pounds plus, that's where it drops to 5.4%. Standard overnight, very similar results. So uh, 6% to zone two, followed by 5.9. Really, I think the highest 6.4 and the low is 5.4, which is the same that we saw on the priority overnight. Um, similar results on uh, by weight. So 6.7, 6.6, pretty much across the board. The exception being once you get to uh, 70 pounds, then it drops to 5.5%. Two day tells an entirely different story. So when you look at this to zones two, three, and four, which anyone here would imagine you're not using two day to zone two, three, and four, um, that's where it's 5.4%. Once you start hitting zone five and on, which is where two-day would start being utilized, where ground can no longer really replace the, the two-day service, now you're seeing that jump to 7.9%. So if you're using two-day service, odds are don't plan for a 5.9% increase. You should probably anticipate being close to 8% for those particular shipments. So I think that one's one that's really important, and you'll see a similar result on three-day. When you look at it by weight, however, uh, very similar results across the board. So the weight distribution really doesn't impact the, the magnitude of the increase. Three-day, here you see very similar result, but even, even worse to a certain extent. 11.9% um, was the increase last year. So now you're piggyback off, piggybacking off of that level of increase. 7.8%, uh, 7.9% increase this year. Uh, and then when you compare that to the to the near zones, where it's only four and a half percent, but again, no one's using three day services on two, three, and four. Um, so again, here's where you want to budget. Whether you use three day or two day, you really want to budget a seven point nine, close to eight percent increase uh, in those particular areas, just based on uh, what the likely profile would be. Weight distribution does not have much of an impact here either. 6.4% becomes the average across the board. Again, heavily, in, heavily inflated by uh, or impacted by the zone 2, 3, 4 being so low that it appears to be lower than it is because uh, 6.4% would not be a, an accurate indication of what somebody would actually receive in, in terms of increase. On their national side, uh, we only have two slides. Um, Keep this rather simple. Last year's increase is on the left, uh, the 2023. That's where you took certainly more significant increase than we did in this year. Uh, this year's increases were pretty much in line with, I would say, 5.8 up to about 6.4% on the export side. Uh, on the import side, it's a little bit lower, 5.1 to about 6.3%. Um, we do have a breakdown for some of the more common lanes. So you'll see... Again, for on the export side, Western Europe, uh, one of the highest, 6.7%, depending on the, the service level, down to six. Uh, export to China is around 5.9%, down to 5.5 for the economy. Uh, and then pretty much six to 6.7% on Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. Import, as you can imagine, China is the biggest with 6.6% pretty much across the board. Um, from Western Europe, we're seeing only 4.74%, so pretty low, all things considered, uh, and an import from Hong Kong, 5.3% across the board. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kenneth, um, and that's start our timer, so I'll have to see, I think we're okay on time. Oh yeah, you have it. 
All right, thank you. A lot of good information, huh? I hope you took good notes. There's a test before you can have lunch. If you fail, you get no lunch. So uh, again, I'm Kenneth Moyer. I'm a partner at LJM as well and uh, vice president. The reason I'm allowed to be up here is I spent 16 years with UPS, eight years in the pricing and revenue management department. So that gives me a little insight into um, you know, how these things are constructed, what the conversations are like around a GRI. So Thomas really told you what the GRI is. I'm going to try to tell you why it is what it is, right? Why did they pick 5.9? Why did they announce it when they did? So obviously, we're going to start with FedEx because they're a little bit ahead of UPS at the moment. So their 5.9% announcement was on the lower end of expectations, so market or industry expectations. Uh, prior to the announcement, this presentation was going to be about predicting what the rate increase would be. But then right before we got here, FedEx announced this because they didn't want me to have a weekend. And so uh, now we know what it is. But when we aggregated all the industry expectations and predictions, 5.9 was, was well within it, but it was on the lower end. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go. Also, the August 29th date is somewhat significant. So this is the earliest announcement any of us can ever remember. And we, some of us have been doing this longer than we want to admit. And that also, I think, is significant. And we'll talk about that. So the fact that FedEx announced on the lower end of expectations and earlier than, than um, any other time in memory, what does that say about how FedEx views themselves, how FedEx views the market, and what they think is going to happen? So we're going to talk about that. So first, I want to go over what the environment that FedEx is making these decisions in. So when they're sitting around the boardroom talking about what the GRI should be, what are the things that are weighing on them? What are the factors they're discussing? So one of them are the micro or macroeconomic factors we're facing today, right? High inflation, high interest rate, high consumer debt. All these things are pushing downward. They're putting downward pressure on demand for package volumes, right? And we see it across our whole client base in most industries, volumes are lower than they have been in the past. In addition to that, there are more competent and viable options today than there have been for a long time. And that is also putting downward pressure on FedEx volumes. In addition to that, FedEx picked up 5% of UPS's volume leading up to the Teamsters negotiation, right? So there's a 5% diversion of the UPS volume to FedEx during leading up to the, to the expiration of the UPS Teamsters contract. And FedEx wants to keep that volume, right? So all these things played into their decision. So their 5.9% increase announcement does two things. And they're kind of, uh, they, they towed the line. They kind of walked, walked the, uh, across the top of the fence here. So first of all, for them on a positive side, is it really sets the new level of expectation for GRIs above the historical norm. So for a decade before COVID, it was 4.9%, right? 4.9, 4.9, 4.9. It was very predictable. During COVID, especially as Thomas mentioned last year, it was significantly higher. So this year it came down, but it's still above the historic norm. So they're basically saying, forget the days of 4.9. The bar has been moved, right? So for them, that's a positive, but in an in a environment of declining volumes, it's still a softer message. Hey, I know it's a big increase, but it's not as bad as last year, right? So in an environment where they're trying to gain market share, it's a softer message than, hey, this is historically high and you're just going to have to accept it. Next, by announcing that, it puts tremendous pressure on UPS to follow suit, right? The fact that FedEx announced a 5.9 means it's going to be hard for UPS to say anything different, which of course we see that they didn't, right? UPS, I'm sure, and all the information I picked up, wanted one higher. They wanted a higher GRI than this because they have this new shiny Teamsters contract they have to pay for. And if you look at the construction of that Teamsters contract, 64% of the wage increase in the contract happens in year one. So the bulk of the increase over the next five years happens now. And they want to offset that with the GRI. By announcing 5.9, FedEx denies UPS the ability to do that. 
So it's kind of like UPS is already down a little bit. Let's just give them a little, little extra kick while they're there. Also, the fact that they announced early is significant. I mean, that really surprised a lot of us. And what it did was it, it was kind of them run out there and put their flag in the ground and say, we're announcing, we're announcing now, forcing UPS to react to them. And that took the initiative away from UPS. Okay, so now let's talk about UPS. So UPS announces 5.9% on September 7th. So they basically matched FedEx. Now, as Tom mentioned, Thomas mentioned earlier, we have no details, which to me is kind of funny because they're like, well, we're going to match it. We don't really know how yet. But we're going to match it, right? So we have no details on it yet. Um, and it was done, like I said, only a few days later. And what does that tell us? So the fact that they matched and the fact that they matched so fast, what does that tell us about UPS, their view of the market and themselves in it? So we know they're going to incur higher costs. So this is the environment that UPS is working in now. We talked about FedEx's environment. This is UPS's environment. They have higher labor and operating costs now because of their new Teamsters agreement. They got to pay for a lot of air conditioning now. They're in an environment of a 9.4% decrease year over year in volumes, 2023 to 2022. That is huge, 9.4% lower volumes. And remember, they're in an industry where the vast majority of their costs are fixed. Buildings, airplanes, trucks, labor, you, you, you can't scale that down based on package volume, right? So here's why their volume is down. It's down for a couple of reasons. So first, they're facing all the same macroeconomic pressure that FedEx is facing. In addition, they've got 5% of that volume diversion because of the, the Teamsters contract expiration. And Amazon is pulling more and more and more packages out of the UPS network. So whereas the FedEx is facing one set of challenges, UPS is really facing three. And UPS has declared that their goal is to win back that 5% of diverted volume by the end of the year, which is a very, very aggressive goal. And I think that plays into their, their uh, match of FedEx because if they had announced higher there's no way they would have been able to win back that volume. And, and it's still questionable whether they can. So again, I think they had to match FedEx whether they wanted to or not, because otherwise they don't believe they could have been competitive in this year. Their, the pressure on their margins is going to be enormous this year because of the higher cost and they've got a good GRI, but maybe not their desired GRI. But it's not all bad news for them because by them also matching the 5.9, they have also set the expectation that, don't, don't think 4.9 anymore, take that out of your vocabulary, the new norm is a higher level. All right, so now let's talk about competition because in those GRI discussions and strategy sessions, when they're deciding what to do, competition is always a factor in that, right? Beyond just the top two. So I think... They're going to be really tested this year. A lot of you probably visited some of the new options. You know, I've been coming to this show for a long time, and there weren't nearly as many options 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago that there are today. So Amazon is in the process of launching competitive services. The post office is more viable. Regional parcel carriers are expanding their coverage. And those clearly overshadowed the decision on this year's GRI, and they will become a larger and larger and larger factor uh, moving forward. All right, now I want to talk, so that, that covers 2023 GRI and the motivations and the environment and how those decisions were derived. I, I want to talk a little bit about projecting in the future. So take your magic eight ball and shake it up, and this is, this is what I think we're going gonna to see in the future. So first... I would set your expectation that 5.9 to 6.9 is our new normal. That's what I would expect to see in the, in the years coming up. Now, of course, there's always macro factors that can change that, but I would set the expectation that that's what we're going to see from now on. Also, I expect the continuation of the trend of larger accessorial increases than base rate increases. And as Thomas mentioned, there's a whole session on accessorials later, but I do want to touch on this for, for one reason. Pre-COVID, our average client, their accessorial spend compared to their total spend was in the high teens to mid-20s. 
Now it's between 30 and 40% of their spend is accessorials. And we have a number of shippers, particularly if they have a large international profile, that more than 50% of their spend is in accessories. So they actually spend more in ancillary fees than in base rate. And I expect that, that trend to continue. I also expect the trend to continue that there'll be new, you know, shipping on Tuesday fees, right? New, new magical fees that come up that you have to deal with and more fees introduced at non-GRI times, you know, mid-year introductions, right before peak introductions. And even if it's not a new fee, it could be a new application of an old fee, right? Additional handling, the inches shrink or... Um, the weight goes down, something like that. So we, there's something to keep, keep in top, on top of. And their goal is always twofold. Number one is to generate revenue. And number two is to mold shipper behavior. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then one thing I really think is coming that's going to be a dramatic change. I mean, one of the biggest changes we've seen in a decade or two in the pricing environment is the introduction or the deepening of surge or dynamic pricing. And we're going to talk a little bit more of that uh, here. So this would be akin to, uh, you know, you go to a baseball game, you're going to have to pay more to see the Yankees play than the Orioles play, right? So, or if you go to a hotel, and if you go to a hotel in a college town at homecoming, you're going to pay more than if it's a date in the summer, right? So as right now, with the peak season surcharges and demand surcharges that UPS and FedEx apply, it's demand based on a macro level, right? Christmas time, the rates go up. I think it's going to be consistently moved down more to the micro level, right? So I think around all major shipping holidays, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, you'll see Father's Day is not up there. I mean, we get the short end of that stick. Um, but anything that drives a lot of shipping behavior, I think you'll see the rates go up. So you won't have a consistent rate throughout the year. There'll be new demand surcharges for those. I also think we're going to start to see day by day pricing so that you are going to pay a different amount depending on the day a week you ship. So Monday is traditionally the busiest shipping day for the carriers. And a lot of you probably Monday is your, your busiest day. I think we're going to get to an environment where we pay more for a shipping on Monday than we do on Wednesday. So here's an example. This is what it looks like today. UPS ground zone two, one pound. It doesn't matter what day you ship it, it's the same rate. I think what we're gonna to go to is if you wanna ship that package on Monday, it's gonna cost you more than it does on Wednesday. And it might, that might cost you more than Friday. And this is a total win-win for the carriers because no matter what you decide to do, they win. If you say, look, I have to ship that package on Monday, it was a weekend order, I can't delay it. Fine, you have to pay more money, so they're happy. If you say, I'm going to, we just got to save some money. I'm going to push that off to Wednesday when they're, they have extra capacity. Then they're, ha they're also happy, right? Because you spread out or evened out their volume flow. So peak season and the demand surcharges worked so well for them. It did everything it was supposed to do. It generated new revenue. And we saw it in our own client base. October shipments became August shipments, which is what they wanted. So no matter what you decide, they win. So I think we're just going to see more and more and more of these types of fees. So kind of get ready for that. So our takeaways, if you're going to remember anything, remember these. So as Thomas went through, there's significant changes in the, the GRI this year than years past. So what you can't do is say, well, this is what changes impacted our costs last year and project it to 2024. It won't work. Or even the year before to this year, it won't work. You really got to look at your profile because... Your, your increase could be less than 5.9 or it could be 17%, depending on what you ship and where you're shipping. So, and this is kind of where, we, where we're, I get into that again. Based on your profile, don't bank on 5.9%. I, I hear it all the time where someone says, well, I took my spend last year and I added 5.9% and somehow we're still $400,000 over budget. Well, it's based, it's based on your profile. So you really got to understand that. Now, some potentially good news, I'll give you a little good news in the, in the end of the tunnel, is because of those macroeconomic factors we talked about before, because of the slowing demand, because there's more competition, I think now, much more so than during the COVID period, you have an opportunity to mitigate some of those costs. 
If any of you had to negotiate a contract during COVID, you know how hard it was to extract any concession from the carrier. I mean, I had hair before COVID, but, but now we're swinging back to the shipper, right? So whereas all the leverage really laid with the carriers during COVID because there was plenty of volume, uh, their capacity was, was uh, full, now it's, it's trending backwards. So you have more opportunity to mitigate some of these costs than you may have uh, in the last few years. So last thing, just uh, if you guys don't mind, if you would rate our session, that really helps us when we plan for future sessions and see what, what people liked or, or what they didn't. And now we've got a uh, couple of minutes for questions. Yes, sir. You expect UPS to follow along with FedEx as far as the breakdown? We do very closely. And, you know, they, they always throw a curveball or two in there. But the the pricing theory of both carriers is is very similar, um, particularly the longer zone, the the weight distribution. I, I would think that would be that would be pretty similar. Yeah. So the question was if if UPS expect to follow sort of the breakdown of FedEx. And I think the one slide that we showed sort of illustrates historically they really want to remain within that one percent. Um, so odds are UPS uh, UPS ground we expect to match. Uh, so those services, you know, we'll, we'll expect the 1070 minimum charge. Uh, I think it'd be very difficult for them to go any, any higher there. Sherpos and ground economy vary a little bit anyway, but ground economy is really higher uh, because there's a dollar surcharge, typically a dollar surcharge. Um, so that one's a little bit, a little bit different, but I would fully expect them to, when you look historically and originally we had a lot more uh, data in here that showed UPS historically the increases are nearly identical by category. So uh, really what you see with FedEx is what you should predict with UPS. Any other question? Yep. Does FedEx typically announce your DRI before UPS or is that just like they take advantage of the market? Yes. Yeah, so historically the last few years, FedEx has, has been the earliest, I think historically though mid September is maybe the earliest that they've gone. So this, this was, as Kenneth pointed out, this is way before the expected time frame. Uh, there used to be a strategy going back uh, where uh, FedEx would announce their air increase, UPS would announce ground, then FedEx would air, air and ground, it would match, and then FedEx would come back and match the ground. So there was a whole sort of system for many years. Uh, no collusion, of course, but, but that's how they got away with it. Uh, but that's changed now to FedEx, really in the last few years has, has sort of jumped the gun um, and sort of set that expectation beforehand. And pretty much every year they follow each other. Do you think that demand surcharges are anticipation of the implementation of dynamic prices? You want me or you? Sure. So can you repeat that? Uh, do you think that the implementation of demand surcharges are the opener or the anticipator of uh, uh, dynamic pricing in the future? Yes. So your question is if the accessorials sort of tie into um, dynamic pricing in, in the future? Yeah. So, you know, the way I, and, and Kenneth, I view it maybe a little bit differently. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to become a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday type surcharge. Um, there was a session on this yesterday that was pretty interesting. Um, now, one thing that I would add is you know, this doesn't have to be in your contract. They don't have to rip up every contract and come up with new ones saying, now we're going to apply this. They have the benefit of the service guide. If they want to introduce, introduce a Monday surcharge starting next week, they can. And your, your contract, I can guarantee everyone out here does not, well, 99% of the people would not have a contract that protects you against that. Um, I don't know if you'll get to that level, but I also wouldn't anticipate it a year-round peak surcharge like they've had. Um, I mean, they, they are introducing fees so UPS already introduced a new fee now that's going to apply starting October. I haven't looked at the detail, but that's a pre-GRI GRI. You know, so to me, the the sort of state of 5.9% is sort of this hocus pocus number that's out there. And really where they're getting you is on the accessorials. You know, and that's where I mean we had clients last year that took 25% rate increases because of certain accessorials based on their profile. Um, and the peak surcharges, when you look at invoices now. The amount of charges that tied to peak surcharges, which really falls into that bucket, um, there's there's no reason why they couldn't introduce 
like kind of set a Monday or Wednesday surcharge if they wanted to uh, and start doing that. And it would come in the form of accessorials, I believe. So the uh, peak surcharge was renamed demand surcharge and the rate was announced through like January 15th or something. Do you think that they're going to announce that it's going to be extended indefinitely, like peak in 2023? You know, I Personally, I think so. I don't know if you have an opinion. I think it will, but I do think the pressures of the new carriers coming into play. I mean, Amazon is is on the doorstep, and it's not the Amazon that we've you know historically talked about marketplace so forth. They are starting to pick up. They're doing beta testing in certain markets. They have an LTL component where they're outsourcing that. They're inducting it in, and they are moving as a UPS and FedEx outfit. Um, it's not a two day guarantee like they're they're. Uh, online solution, but they are becoming a viable threat. You can only keep doing what they're doing for so long before the post office comes into play like they are now going to have your weights, Amazon becoming a, a direct competitor. Competition sort of cures a lot of these things. So at some point they might pull back the reins, uh, but they're going to milk it as long as they can. Just to add to that, one thing we see, um, and we've seen them for a number of years, but they're getting more and more prevalent and more and more punitive are early termination fees and minimum commitment language in contracts. And a, a lot of that is in response to that competition. It's like, well, how do I make sure that 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 our shippers can't explore these these other options? And it's going to be that's going to come to head at some point. It's going to be interesting to see how how uh, we're able to navigate through that. You want to tell them how they throw that in the invoice now, UPS? Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, that's a good point. So for years, we've seen these early termination and minimum commitment clauses in contracts, but they were never enforced. So we saw the first ones ever enforced by UPS earlier this year. Uh, we still haven't seen one with FedEx yet, but just I know there's other sessions I get into that. Just be very careful about signing those because they're they're becoming more real than than they used to be. Okay. Well, this is a little off topic, but the the money back guarantees for ground that disappeared during COVID, the environment doesn't really justify the keeping them, but yet there's no chance of them coming back. I mean, I'm going to ask you, is there any chance of the carriers restoring their money back guarantee? There, there's a chance, but uh, we're, we, I wouldn't hang my hat on it, right? I wouldn't hang my hat on it, right? So there is a chance, yes. And of course, if one of the carriers feels that they get a significant advantage by being the first one to do it, then then that might change it. But I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't anticipate that at any time soon. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So they already have like like Thomas mentioned, they're beta testing in certain markets. Um, obviously, they got the delivery down pat. The, the pickup is uh, where, where the, the, there's some work to be done, right? So they have some LTL component to that where they pick up at a, at a company, deliver it to a terminal, and then, and then deliver it. Uh, that works really well for certain profile shippers and not for others, right? So for large shippers, that works great. For smaller shippers, not as much. The other thing is they have terrific uh, urban coverage. So high population density, you know, a lot of their deliveries are still uh, made through crowdsourcing, which works great when you got a, a high population density. Uh, in places like where I live in rural South Carolina, it doesn't work at all unless you're going to tractor or deliver them. So, um, so they still have some things to work out, but they are moving in that direction. And I think we'd be more surprised than not if they didn't uh, enter the market in a big way. Yeah, and just to add to that too. So Q1 of 24, so in a few months is when they're expecting to sort of expand on the beta. Who knows if that'll be reality. The benefit that they have, obviously, is they already have the data. They already know which clients they can go after. You know, this partnership with with uh, UPS over the years, their volume now with UPS is half what it was just a few years ago. Um, they have the data. They know which clients they could target. Um, I mean, they have all the benefits. In terms of from a pricing perspective, what we've seen, hugely beneficial for e-com, lighter weight, up to 20, 30 pounds. Once they get to that, though, and B2B, we're not seeing competitive pricing so far. It's a small, small sample set. And you know you can still tell that they're trying to work through some of the details and so forth. But um, yeah, we do expect to happen very soon. But it's going to be market by market. you know. So it's not an explosion. Just go nationwide right away. I think they just very strategically start start finding you know ideal candidates for their service. There's somebody back here. Yeah. I have a question on S-Sword. 
contract agreements are the carriers receptive to freezing accessorials uh, in, for the length of the contract or for a contract period? So basically, uh, not just discounting an accessorial, but basically if you have a, uh, you want a, a $2 straight delivery surcharge rather than a 50% reduction, for example? No, freezing in terms of the published service guide, so it's frozen for a period of time, so you're not subject to increases randomly, like tomorrow they'll, you know, put a Monday surcharge. Tom, that's a good question. So... The way that I've always approached it is if it's not in your contract and it's introduced in the service guide, you're now vulnerable to it. Uh, there are the one-off, and we'll start talking about you know maybe larger global shippers or the guys that are spending hundreds of millions where you, know, you really have departments that have sort of worked out the contracts and so forth, where there are some limitations in terms of that. But accessorials tends to be one of those things where a new one gets introduced and it, and it applies to 99.9% .9 of the people out there and now you have to negotiate it. You know, you have to recognize it, you have to, to negotiate it. So you, you really can't get an agreement that locks you in with, with very few exceptions. What do you follow up to that? Are there shorter contracts appearing in the market or generally are they um, yearly or five? Or so typical contract runs three years. You can sign a, sign a, a shorter one remember, you're not committed to a contract, meaning just like they can raise your rates whenever you want, you can exit an agreement whenever you want. So you don't have to go to the term. So typically it's better to get the longest one possible because you're locking, you're, you're getting that rate, but you can exit it uh, if, if you need to. So we're, we're over time, but Thomas and I will hang out right outside. If anyone has any other questions, you can come see us or we can uh, exchange cards and answer your questions. Thanks, sir.